So, Pete, I was listening to a podcast the other day with Arnold Schwarzenegger's son, Joe Benya, I think that's how you say his last name. But um, the podcast was really interesting because the podcast was asking him about like how he started lifting. So obviously everyone knows that he's Arnold Schwarzenegger's son and he is probably the one that looks like Arnold the most. But um, on the podcast they go and they explain like, okay, so you know, your dad's Arnold Schwarzenegger. What happened? What was the advice that he gave you? And he said that what my dad told me was he gave me a copy of his encyclopedia of bodybuilding and said, everything that you need to know is in here. All you have to do is follow everything in here. If you have any other questions, just let me know. So I was like really taken back when I'm like, wow, if he gave his son the book and said, here, this is all you need to do, then that's what really he truly believes in. Because all these years, it was kind of like a guess. Like, is this true? Like, did he really train right. this way? Like, is this something that he would like? And I guess the age old question is, would you recommend this to your son? Because right. if my son came to me, he'd actually recommend Yeah, it. like, dad, how do I train? And I had a book that was not legit. I would not give it to my son. I probably would have told him exactly what to do. But the fact that he gave it to his son yeah. says volumes about that right. book, right? So it, it kind of like says what we all were thinking originally, like, okay, yeah. this, is, this is legit then. So I want to talk about the hidden secrets in Arnold's Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding because there's a lot of things in there that are amazing tips that people have overlooked. So the first thing that I have is I want to say first and foremost, it is definitely a huge, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but like a huge, all the images in there for motivation purposes are mm -hmm. great. There is nothing else that I've ever picked up mm -hmm. that by far, when I look yeah. at those pictures, get motivated to train. Yeah. Those guys just had a whole different level of like physique and the way they looked and it's really motivating from that sense. So I think in that sense, if you're looking for motivation to train and I hate, I hate that. But sometimes you need like inspiration. I think you go yeah. through that book and you're like, wow, look at the way these guys look, look at the way they train. Yeah. I think that's a hidden secret in the book. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing, and a lot of people point this out as well, um, it's not necessarily even just how the, the physiques looked so much more impressive in my opinion than they do today. It was the whole mentality around bodybuilding itself. You know, yeah. so today most people are kind of caught up in, okay, I don't really care about training. I don't necessarily enjoy it. I don't really care about dieting. I don't necessarily enjoy it. Like I'm just doing this for the outcome. And you know, my opinion on all the guys back then is they really weren't doing it just for the outcome. Like they loved the lifestyle. Like they loved training. You know, they loved following the nutrition plan. They loved the outcome that came with it, but that wasn't the only goal. And I think today so many people are focused on just that end goal. And they just say, listen, tell me the best way to train so I build muscle. Tell me the best way to diet. And a lot of that comes down to, you know, enjoying the process. You know, the guys that get the best results, like, they live it. They love it. You know what I mean? And I think that that's an element a lot of people are missing in their plan that will lead to more success. So I definitely drew a lot of that from that book. Like, just reading it, I got so inspired to do it, you know? And if I was the type of person that just said, hey, listen, like, I just want the, the workout routine, some people like that probably just skipped to that one page in the book, looked at the workout routine, and then said, hey, it didn't work. And you know how many people read that book, oh, use yeah. that plan and say, oh, that's overtraining, it didn't work. But like, did you read the entire book and did you gather all the information from the book is the real question. I know it's funny, I was going through, so I knew I wanted to do this topic today. So I was like going through the book just to see like, all right, maybe I missed some stuff. Maybe there's something else I could talk about that I kind of like overlooked over the years. And my book, my encyclopedia my, is destroyed. Yeah. Pages are everywhere. Nothing is together. Like the, basically the no, binding of the book, book is just the two copies. My original That's one did too. I, I actually bought a second one. I have three copies. You, three copies. I have three yeah, copies. My second one, give them to me. I, yeah, I said I'm gonna keep this one intact. The yeah. first one got destroyed. I have a hardcover one actually. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah so the hardcover hard cover one I don't touch. Yeah, I don't even touch it. So the other one's the one I use. So like it's funny. I'm looking through it, and at one point I was like, oh, this looks interesting, and I literally had the page in my hand. I'm like, I should just bring this to Pete and yeah. <laughs> go over it. Just bring it. But uh, it's funny how how much even from what, so I got that book at. 14 yeah I, w I got it probably so like over 15, 20 years ago yeah. over yeah. 20 years ago and i still have the same book with a still highlighter that i highlighted mm -hmm. i wrote in it so i have all my notes in there it's pretty cool when you look back on it yeah but um the other one of the things that i mean we we're kind of talking off camera about this like the hidden secrets in the right. book was the training intensity and yeah. this is kind of where we got screwed up as kids because yeah. you watch and you read what he says in the book and I don't think it was meant literally. Like he right. talks about training to failure and things like that. And in fact, those guys never trained to failure the way that we yeah. thought they did. So in the era that me and you started, 
training to failure was a thing. Yeah, Max OT big. was a thing. Yeah. You have to take every set so you can't do no more. And that was the total opposite of how Arnold trained. I mean, if you look at the clips, and not so much in Pumping Iron. Pumping Iron really didn't show too much of like the training to fit. Like, you didn't see the end of any set. Really. No, but then it was when he joined and started, um, what was his supplement company? Muscle Farm, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Was it Muscle Farm? Muscle Farm, yeah. Uh, when he started his own supplement line and they came out with those other clips from Pumping Iron. You're right, they had like the released ones. Yeah. Like, you watch him train, you're like, wow, he didn't go to failure at all. No, you would see those were full clips of, like, the entire set, which in Pumping Iron, they kind of made it, like, a yeah. highlight reel. So you just saw a couple reps here and there. So you couldn't really gauge the actual intensity of the set. Yeah, but when you saw those those full clips, you know, a lot of people today, you know, that, that, that have to train to failure have that training OCD where they're like, you know, if you're not training to failure, you're not doing anything, we'll probably look at those clips and say like, wow, he's just doing warm-up sets, you know? Or those sets don't count. But I mean, if you look at his physique, obviously they did something. I mean, in pumping iron, Lou Ferrigno's incline benching, and Lou Ferrigno's 260, yeah. 270, yeah. and he's incline pressing 185. He would, That was not to failure. No. But you yeah. kind of miss, you overlook that when you're looking yeah. at the book because I think it was the time that we looked at it. I'd be curious to say like if we took like a younger guy yeah. and had him on here what his takeaway was from it yeah. because obviously it was a different era of bodybuilding. Like so for example, somebody who grew up listening like Lane was the person for them. Mm -hmm. Like I'd be curious what happens if they would pick up the book what they would think. Yeah, I mean it's really a good point because depending on what era you kind of started at, you know, we always take stuff from like when we first started that was ingrained with us and that's always going to carry with us no matter how we interpret anything, yeah. right? So like you said, you mentioned like Max OT, you know, um, Dorian Yates training was like pretty popular too when we first started, you know, a lot of that. Like we, we watched Ronnie Coleman, Jay Cutler were working out. It's so like a little bit of elements of like all these things. And for me, the biggest one, I think, like you said, Max OT was very big. Yeah, so it was, was one of the first things I learned. I would say that's probably one of the first training systems I learned. You know, this is before I even, like, went back and actually discovered more of Arnold's training and old school bodybuilding. And um, it was one of the things that I really kind of dug into, and that was failure was a big part of that. And progressive overload was another one. So I always looked through everything of the lens of, okay, like, if this is how we train, where does the progressive overload fit into this? And I think that was a good thing that I took from that, you know? I eventually obviously got away from the very low volume aspect of it, but I think that element of it is something you can apply to anything. And I think that it, it's interesting where we started. If we started, you know, in a different era, we might have looked at it completely different. You know, if we were in that era and we didn't know anything about more modern bodybuilding methods, how we would have interpreted the actual training. Yeah. Well, that was the thing. When we took it, it was training to failure. So every yeah. set had to be taken to failure, and that was not what they did. Well, would you want to talk about that a little more since you were the... Yeah, and, um, you know, I think that's why most people fail, no pun intended, on his program, you know, because if you Google Arnold Schwarzenegger's workout, or you, you, you know, I make tons of video on his training and, and guys in his era, and you get two people on opposite ends of the fence, you know, you get... One person who says, yep, this is the best training system. I've been following it my, my entire career. I've been training, you know, 20, 30 years, whatever it is. And I've always made the best gains following a similar routine to this. And then you get the other guys, you know, comp there's no one in the middle that says, yeah, it's good, but there's other ways to train. You get the other people on the other end and they say, like, I burnt out within weeks. It was the worst way I tra to train ever. You know, I got no results. I got smaller. I got weaker. And I always say, and I've made videos on this topic, too. The reason you're not getting results on this program or any other program in general is your interpretation of the actual system itself. So if you look at Arnold's training program, and obviously it's high volume, right? If you interpret it in such a way where I have to take every set to failure to and do these entire workouts, because some people will literally say, if I'm not going to failure, the set doesn't count. So then if they say, if I'm following Arnold's program, they're going to apply that failure to every single set, which no, it's not going to work. If you're doing 20, 30 sets at a time and every single one of them is to failure, it's not going to work out the same way as leaving one or two reps in the tank, let's just say, and then focusing on the volume. So that's the biggest misinterpretation of his training system and all the guys back then. When we talk about high volume training, you know, like I've mentioned before, people even say to me, they'll, they'll watch how I train sometimes and look at my set and they say, you know, Pete, you probably had another two, three reps. You know, on average, I probably leave like one or two reps in the tank on most sets. And I say, yeah, that's, that's by design because I'm training with a higher volume. So I'm going to have to scale back the intensity a bit. And I think when people read his encyclopedia and they don't actually watch how he trains, because obviously it's just a book. You're not seeing the sets. You're looking at pictures and you're reading. So you're, you're going to interpret that based on what you're reading. And a lot of people will interpret that because he does use the term failure. 
And a lot of guys back then used the term failure when they talked about stats. Sergio Brady was one of them also. Um, and he, he did a crazy amount of volume. And he said, yes, take the sets to failure. But if you ever watch a clip of him training, his version of failure, his actual definition of failure is different because he's talking about the last clean rep with good form where the target muscle is working. Once he feels like if he does another rep, the target muscle is not going to get more out of it, he racks it. You know, These guys all trained back then in a, in a way where they didn't need spotters. You know, They trained with training partners and they had spotters, but just think about that. If I tell you bench to failure without a spotter, that's going to be, you know, it's not a good idea, right? But if I say do as many reps as you can with good form without a spotter, you're probably fine. And I think that's the key that people misinterpret when they talk about his training. Well, it was one of the things, too, when you mentioned Ronnie Coleman and growing up with, like, watching those guys. And those guys were training. I always instinctively said, like, okay, Ronnie Coleman's benching four plates. Right. The same way I would bench 135, 185. Right. right. So it's... And, and at the time, I would never, if I'm talking to myself way back then, I would have laughed at what I'm saying right now. Yeah. But it's like, you don't need much weight to actually stimulate the muscle in the way that they're actually talking about. And the weight is irrelevant it in is. that case. Yeah, it's and it's very hard. It's kind of like a hard pill to swallow when you're yes. younger and you're trying yes. to gain muscle. Like, no, 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 I got to put more weight on the bar. But in right. fact, I think the fact that if you take more weight off the bar, you're going to be way better off. Yeah. Strength comes over time. You know what I mean? And people are always, that's the thing. If you look at, if you look at the average 15 or 18 year old that walks into the gym for the first time, he might be struggling to bench 135. He's never trained before, right? There's nothing wrong with that. He's never trained before. And then if you look at the average 25 year old who maybe never took bodybuilding seriously, but he just happens to have been in the gym and trained consistently, he might be benching, you know, 200 pounds, 225, let's just say. And all that comes is just from training over time. You know, your strength levels will go up no matter how good your training program is or how bad it is. You know, you get people on terrible training plans. But just because they've been in the gym consistently over time, their strength is going to build up. You know, strength is the skill. It's, it's about becoming efficient at the lift over time. Yeah. So a lot of people in bodybuilding also get caught up in that mentality. Oh, yeah, I saw this guy benching this amount. If I want to get as big as him, I have to lift that same amount of weight. And like we mentioned, you know, there's videos of Lou Ferrigno training in his prime with 185 pounds on the incline bench. Yeah. I mean, obviously he's not, you know, he was a strong guy, but he wasn't concerned with when I'm training, I have to be lifting as heavy as possible. Sure, there was heavy lifting. A lot of those guys did train for periods of the year with heavier weights, lower reps. But again, like if the goal is actual bodybuilding, like your training should be bodybuilding specific. Well, I mean, perfect example, if you want to talk about Lou Ferrigno, in the scene of pumping iron when he's doing the overhead presses with 225, 245, that wasn't even to failure. No, that wasn't at all. That wasn't to failure. I would say that was probably like a 9 RPE. Yeah. Maybe an 8. You know, and he did a lot of things where he would start kind of... With more full range of motion and then go into a bit more partial range of motion, he would do that too. And then as the set got a little bit harder, he would kind of almost build in his own little version of muscular failure because he would keep shortening the range of motion to the point where he couldn't contract another full rep. But he's not actually reaching failure during the set. There's a big difference between fatiguing the muscle and getting to the point where not another rep is physically possible. Yeah, he did like those half reps. Like that yeah. was kind of weird. That was the one thing that I wasn't was watching. Odd. I never really yeah got never, it. I still don't understand exactly why he did it. I mean, he was huge. <laughs> yeah, no, obviously. It so worked. it worked. Yeah, but it's like I, I remember watching that as a kid. That scene of him yeah. incline press. I'm like, why is he doing half reps? Yeah, I still don't know. I don't think Arnold did that though, because if you watch the clips of no. Arnold training, it didn't look like he did that. His was extreme range of motion, if anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the complete yeah. opposite end of the spectrum, and I think. Um, you know, I think a lot of times people do things, again, that work for them based on more like a personality type thing. And I think people get too focused on like, like so someone who's like extremely fo- fo- uh, like obsessive over like, okay, the right and wrong way to do this, we'll look at it and say, there has to be a reason why he's doing partial reps and there has to be a reason why Arnold's doing you know full range reps. But a lot of it just comes down to how motivated you are to train and what type of training do you enjoy because you're going to get those results based on the consistency of it and doing the correct things over time. If we're talking about a minute detail, which is like what his range of motion is, I don't think that's going to make or break your program. Yeah. You know? Yeah, agreed. I want to sh- shift gears a little bit. So one of the other things that he talked about in the book that I think is a hidden secret was he said in the beginning when you first start training, you need to focus on building your base first. Yes. And this has been lost in the fitness yes, industry now. I mean, I watch videos on Instagram of people, 
all right, this is an upper body focused workout and they're hitting rear delts and these guys right. have no muscle. Right. I'm like, yeah. they're worried about hitting rear delts at the angle that you have to hit rear delts at and they have no, right, exactly. no muscle. Yeah. So it's like, what are you doing? And I think right. you have to, again, it always goes back to the basics, but Arnold says you need to focus on building the foundation of the house before you can worry about refining it. Right. And those movements, the rear delt this, the lat focus yeah. this, those are refining movements. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't be doing those movements, but those movements need to be done at a later point in your career. You need yeah. to be focusing in the beginning on compound movements. And I think I watched a video of yours where you talked yeah. about this. I think it was with lats, I think. And you mentioned, you know, in the beginning, you need to be doing more rows and things like that. And then over time, it kind of evolves. Yes. And I agree with that 100% because yeah. you need to be doing those big compound movements to build as much muscle as possible everywhere. Right. And not just 100%. worrying about, okay, I'm fully optimizing my rear delt. Right. It's like, no, you want to activate as much muscle as possible yes. as often as you can in the beginning to stimulate growth all over. And I think that goes overlooked nowadays. And I think that that's yeah. one of the biggest secrets in that book yeah. is focusing on building the yeah. foundation first. Yeah, because people will look at that book and they will say, okay, what was the competition routine? And when, you see, when they see the competition routine, it, it's crazy high volume it's crazy high frequency it's a ton of work so people think okay that's what built his physique and that's again right. a misinterpretation because right. if you look at his earlier training manuals he's even advocated for full body sessions three mm -hmm. times a week um, you know and when you kind of dissect all his training programs over the year you start to understand that there was a competition program and then there was more of a base building program or a mass game program which is where he actually built his foundation you know the, those competition routines again I've talked about this many times their whole philosophy on training back then is a little bit different than today. Most of the time now, you know, days now, training kind of stays the same in the off season and, and pre contest. Back then, it would shift drastically because yeah. they were doing tons of cardio. They were right. doing extra volume to kind of make up that calorie burning expenditure, and um, their training got very excessive. But they they weren't mentally training to build more muscle. They were training to refine the physique pre contest, which is a very different thing. So a lot of people miss out on that, and they kind of skip that whole mass game phase of training, which is what I always recommend to guys. If you haven't built your physique yet, you're not ready for the advanced stuff. If anything, that's going to make you take longer to actually get to your goal. You're going to make much better progress focusing on the basics, doing it consistently over time, building that base. Then you can refine it over time. And um, I think that's the biggest thing people misinterpret, especially today. Like you said, everyone's focused on, is this a workout for lats, middle back, you know, rear delts? What is it? Oh, I wouldn't do this because, you know, I have good good lats, but I'm trying to focus on rear delts, so I'm going to do this exercise. And, you know, but you're 160 right, pounds. <laughs> exactly. You have to look at the entire physique. If you're 160 pounds, you know, provided that you're not like 5'2", you know, if you're an average male, you know, and you're under, you know, 180, 190 pounds, you're probably not ready for specialized routines yet. Agreed. And you need to look at your entire physique, not just one body part. Because people are looking at one body part, but your entire physique hasn't fully developed into a like a solid base yet so you need to forget about all that stuff for now it's good that you are aware of it and you need to focus on just adding as much mass to that physique first then refine that's really the way you have to go about it yeah and so that's a big hidden secret there yeah the other thing that i also have written down as another hidden secret was he talked about in that book he talks about the quality of contraction and the pump and we talked about this i think two episodes ago or three episodes ago at this point i don't remember but we talked about how the pump and that mind muscle connection, yeah. you know, people talk about, oh, you're training for a pump, but it's not about the pump. It's about the quality of the contraction. Correct. And yeah. no one talks about that again. And then, and I come from the powerlifting background and I, you know, I've competed very well in powerlifting. I was very good at it. And with that, there's just moved away from point A to point B. And you kind of take that mentality with you. And there's a certain element of your training that kind of should have that in there. But at, I would say, 80% of your training should be focused on the quality of the contraction that you're getting during each lift. And Arnold emphasized that so, so much. And he talked about that a lot in the book, the quality of the contraction. And I think yeah. that that's way overlooked now. You know, in today's, they don't really focus on that. No. They focus on the angles of pull right. and yes, yes, how yes. the muscles move. But you have to actually feel the muscle working every yes. step of the way. And I yeah. think that that's been overlooked. So I think that's another hidden secret in there. Yeah, it's a huge one because, and I've talked about this too. I, I, I kind of got this from Arnold. It was more experimentation over the years, but like definitely the, the idea came from Arnold watching him train 
it's a it's what I like to call you know a lot of people will, will focus on you know like you said like angles so if they say I want to hit my lats in this exercise and they'll, and they'll say how do I hit my lats focus on the angle focus on where the elbows go focus on you know all these different things and I always say if you want to get the most out of any exercise for that body part you're focusing on two things getting the best contraction and getting the best stretch of the muscles so I always say as a mental cue when you're doing this set full stretch full contraction and if you can check off both those boxes that set is going to be perfect in terms of building that muscle and that's going to be different for everybody you know you have a slightly different structure than me everybody has a little bit of different structure so if we're doing the same exercise we're not necessarily going to be doing it with the same exact form there might be similarities but if i tell you forget about you know textbook form where if you look at a textbook and it says elbows have to be here this is where you start the movement this is where you stop and I say, okay, we're gonna do a curl or we're gonna do, let's say, a press or we're gonna do a fly. Fly is a great example. You know, people get caught up, okay, where does my elbow have to be? Where does my wrist have to be? What angle? If I tell you, listen, take that pec to a full stretch when you get there, now you're gonna reverse it, go to a full contraction, that's gonna get you the most out of that lift. Right. The technique might be a little bit different. Right. But no one's gonna say, or no one can say, it's not gonna work for you. Because again, yeah, if your body's built a little bit different than mine, the technique should be slightly different. Yeah, agreed. Which kind of leads me into the next one, the next hidden secret that he talks about in that book is basically uh, the priority principle and instinctive training. Mm -hmm. So two things with this. So one, based on what you said, that's instinctive. Finding yeah. mm -hmm. ways of which you need to move right. muscles during a movement to feel it more right. is instinctive. And that's a very, very important element. This is why I recommend training with barbells and dumbbells versus machines because you're able to maneuver yourself yeah. in space to feel that like you right. said you know if i'm following someone online and they tell me okay in the proper direction of the pec is to do this with your elbow right. but that gives me one elbow pain or two i don't right. feel it in the pec i'm not getting anything out of that right it doesn't yes. matter if it's optimal or not correct so you have to kind of figure out instinctively what yeah. works for you in that sense right. and train it wasn't until i got my best results when i stopped worrying about what the book said to do or what this person said to do and I just focus okay what feels right to right. me yeah and also putting that in combination with the priority principle okay there's right. certain areas of my body that I need, I want to bring up so I need to instinctively put them first and instinctively train that to feel what I need to feel out of it to get there yeah everybody and I talk this all the time everybody swears by barbell movements for bicep growth for me that was a total opposite it wasn't until i actually said all right i'm done with this movement yeah that i actually got the yeah. results yeah if it's not working don't keep it in no matter what people say is like a universal rule there, is, there really there's no universal rule when it comes to building muscle you know and you know i i think that's the biggest thing too is people will look at that principle and they'll you know they'll basically talk down on it oh you know the instinctive principle it, it, it doesn't it's not it's not right you right. know but the thing is, again, it's your interpretation of it because mm -hmm. when people use the word instinctive, they're going to look at the literal definition and say, okay, well, instinctively, you know, I want to train for three hours a day, but I know that three hours a day doesn't work. But realistically, what that principle really means is based on the feedback that your body is giving you and based on the results you're getting, tailor your program to you. So if you train for two, three hours a day and you don't get any progress, you don't make any progress doing that, you should be looking at that, analyzing and saying, okay, my body doesn't respond to two to three hours a day of training. Let me cut it back to an hour a day or an hour and a half. That's really more of the practical application of instinctive training. Right. People will look at it and say, I just, I'm going to train based on how I enjoy training. And people will ask me all the time too, Pete, would you prefer to train this way? Or would you, like they'll say, do you prefer to train high volume? Or do you prefer to train low volume? And I always say, it doesn't matter how I prefer to train. It matters what gets me the best results. And I'm going to train the way that gets me the best results. You know, I love training hard. I love doing, you know, I love, we talked about this before, like, you know, when you're 18 years old, 20 years old, going to the gym and just training balls to the wall every single workout, you know, pulling PRs, doing things like that. But I know instinctively now, if I do that, I'm going to either hurt myself or I'm just not going to make any progress at all. So my training, you know, if you want to use the word instinctive, my instinct, my version of the instinctive training now is saying, I can't train that way. I'm going to get hurt. So I'm not going to. Or if I do too much of this, it's going to result in less progress for me. So I have to, you know, change my training based on how my body's responding. Don't go in the gym and just only train the way you want if it's not producing results. If it's producing results, keep doing it. And, you know, one of the things, too, when I was younger, I always would figure out, well, how do I know if this is actually working? Yeah. 
That's a good question. If you have to ask yourself that question, it's not working. Right. Yeah, if you're at You that just point. have to give it a little bit of time. I have yeah. to caveat that with saying that. Yeah. You have to give it a little bit of time. But you know when something's Absolutely. working. You feel the difference when something's working. Absolutely. All these years, I'm like, does that work? Is this actually working? Is this actually doing anything? But when you instinctively train, yeah. like, well, you instinctively like kind of make your own thing out of it. Yeah. You know when something's working yeah. and when something's not working. Yeah, and I say this all the time too. You know, a big thing people will always talk about now is they'll say, you know, yeah, it works, but is it optimal, right? And then when I start to really think about that question, you know, when I first started training, I would look at that and I would say, yeah, that's a good question. How do we make it optimal? Because you say, okay, I'm getting results, but I want to get better results. Right. But when I look at it now, and I, I've talked about this before too, and the reality, when you kind of look back at the progress you've made about people we've worked with and what you've seen over the years, and I've seen this over the years over and over again, in bodybuilding, when you're talking about building muscle, progress being, uh, am I gaining muscle? It really is an all or nothing thing to an extent. You know, it's not like I put on, you know, two pounds of muscle, you know, in six months. If I made my training optimal, I could put on three pounds of muscle. It's literally, it's more of a threshold. Are you training properly enough to get results or are you not? In most right. cases, it's, it's pretty much an all or nothing thing. Right. So if you're making any progress where you're saying, yes, I'm consistently, you know, training hard, growing, getting stronger... There's no reason to optimize your training. You're already optimized. There's nothing you're going to change that's going to get you an extra pound of muscle. And vice versa. If you change one little thing, you're not going to slowly make less progress. You're probably not going to make progress at all or you're going to be making progress. So I think that whole idea about when people get caught up with optimizing training, it, it just shoots you in the foot because, like I said, if you're already making progress, you're optimal. Don't, don't yeah. change anything. Yeah. And the last thing, which is number six on my list, the six hidden secrets, and it's funny because we talked about this last week, but he recommends doing four sets per exercise. Mm -hmm. And the ideal is four to five exercises per major body part and three for smaller. And we were talking about this last week with how many sets do you think you need? So I thought it was a really a hidden gem that he had the answer right there. We were saying, you know, two is too little, you know, five or seven might be, yeah. you know, too much depending on the muscle of exercise that you're doing. So he says that the optimal you should be doing is four. Right. Per exercise. Like that's like the base. Yeah. And three for smaller muscles, he said. Yeah. But I thought that was pretty cool. I was like, oh, we were actually right. talking about this last week. So I think that was the hidden secret of there. Yeah. And an interesting perspective I want to take on that subject too is if he says, you know, and he did, if he says this is the way you should be training as far as how many sets you should be training per exercise and how many exercises, if you accept that and say, okay, that has to be the answer, right? The next thing you should be saying is, what should my training intensity and the quality of sets be like yep. to fit that volume in? And most people yep. will overlook that. That's, because, a, great, that's you know, a great point. They'll look at that and say, okay, Arnold says it has to be four sets, but if I do four sets, that's too many. Okay, but what are you doing in those four sets? Let's flip it and say, okay, we have to do the four sets. How can we optimize the four sets in a way where, okay, that is the best way to train? And I'm not saying I necessarily agree or disagree that four is the magic number or the amount of exercise is the magic number, but if you're gonna follow that principle, you need to look at it and say, okay, how do I actually execute those four sets properly? Because if you look at it and well, say, I have to go to failure, that might not be the answer. And right. then that's where you get people to say, no, Well, again, if you much. put everything together with what we talked about, if you yeah. look at, again, one of the points, I think that was number three or four that we talked about before, it was the quality of the, con the contraction mm -hmm. and the intensity of which yeah. that you're doing it. So that's like really, really important. So I think if you combine those two things together and you're instinctively feeling the muscle, yeah. squeezing it throughout the whole range of motion and that quality of the contraction will make a big difference. And obviously then those four sets will be a lot different than Very if you different. took those sets to failure. Very different. Yeah, because then if you're only focused on failure, you, you're going to at some point miss out on those few things. Because in a lot, that's, that's the issue with a lot of people with training when they, when they focus on like lower volume, high intensity training. It's very hard if mentally you're saying, I'm going to take this set to failure, but also you're focusing on, okay, I'm going to get the best stretch and the best contraction. Because one thing that happens with a lot of people when they focus on training to failure, let's say it's a set of 10 or 12 to failure, as those reps get closer to failure, the form, the technique will start to break down because mentally all they're trying to do is push that set to failure. So if we're talking about something like, you know, with a large range of motion, let's say the lat pull downs. You might get full reps on the first five or six. As it starts getting closer to failure, you'll see people start to shorten the reps a little bit. And uh, again, they're just focused on moving the weight. And over time, you're getting less and less out of those reps as you get closer to failure. But mentally, all you're thinking about is failure. So you think once you reach failure, you got the most out of that set. 
But when we actually look at that and we see exactly what you did during that set, you'll find sometimes that the quality of your set actually goes down just for the sake of reaching failure. And in for bodybuilding, that's not necessarily always a good thing. Yeah, and I was just gonna say that too. It's like, I've, I've trained to failure, you trained to failure. You definitely, if you, again, if we're saying that what Arnold says, you know, Arnold gave his book to his son and right. said everything you need is in here. So if we're going by that, right? Mm -hmm. If you train to failure, you lose that quality of yes. contraction. Yes. Because your muscles are just dead. Everything is just fatigued. It's You're losing that. It's harder to actually contract. It's yes. much harder. So if you think about it, everybody needs to train with a lot less weight in that, if that's the case. And the weight is kind of irrelevant then. Yes. Yeah. And, and you know, again, it kind of also, you have to address kind of at what stage in bodybuilding you're at too because in certain stages you can argue that weight is a little bit more important at different stages weight becomes much less important i think people overemphasize weight in general yeah but there's definitely some element of getting stronger and building your base in the original first few stages of bodybuilding that that is important but again, if your goal is to, to fully maximize your physique, at a certain point, you need to move away from weight itself because yeah. weight is only one tool. And I've talked about this before too. When people focus their entire training plan on just adding weight to the bar, you're going to stall so much quicker than if you're focusing on multiple different areas of training that you can improve on because you're only focusing on one. So if you say, okay, you have all these different elements for progressive overload. One, one element, one form of progressive overload is just adding more weight to the bar. You know, or adding reps to your sets, um, but also you can increase the time under tension. So if you're doing, let's just say, the same weight, but you're getting better reps at it, better stretch, better contraction, they're longer reps. Um, you know, that's that's harder than doing shorter reps. So that's a form of progressive overload. You can always add more sets to your training. You could add more frequency. There's all these things, and if you just get rid of all of them and just say I'm focusing only on weight, when you stall with weight, what do you do? Yeah. You just keep trying to add weight to the bar and then you spin your wheels. But if you say, okay, I've kind of tapped out my strength on this movement, I'm gonna focus more on better stretching, better contraction. Uh, I'm gonna do maybe an additional set of this exercise. I might do, do more frequency for this body part. Now you can build more muscle without ever getting stronger. And I'm not yeah. saying you shouldn't get stronger, but when you've kind of tapped out your strength levels, you know, for me and you right now, if our only goal is listen, I'm gonna grow my legs, um, you know, I'm squatting four plates right now, the only way I'm going to get them bigger is by adding more weight to the bar. That might not be a feasible thing to do in any reasonable amount of right. time. But if I say, okay, I'm going to start training them twice a week, I'm going to train them three times a week, I'm going to add more volume, without ever adding more weight to the bar, I can build more you muscle. Yeah. yeah. So those are the six hidden secrets in Arnold's Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding. So I definitely recommend picking that book up. I mean, you can go to Amazon, but those are the six big takeaways that we got from it. Yeah. Comment below, let us know yours. And that's that.